Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you may happen to be and whether you're watching live or recorded. Welcome to another Nautel Transmission Talk Tuesday webinar. Hey, I got the name right this week. We're on a roll already and the day's just early. We're going to talk about one of my favorite topics today, grounding and lightning protection. I've uh, got a guest host who so Alex Hartman, uh, some of you may know Alex. Alex has uh, been with Nautel for a while as an employee. He's uh, been associated with us for a while before that as both a customer and a uh, contract engineer. And uh, Alex, thanks for coming along. No problem, Jeff. It's always a pleasure. I should add also that Alex is the brains behind our looking glass product. So uh, that, uh, that that was created before before he even uh, signed on board. I think we bought him at the same time we bought the product. I'm not sure how it worked. That's something like that. Yeah, it's, I think it ended up something like that. But <laughs> So we're going to do a little housekeeping here. As always, this webinar is being recorded and archived. And uh, you can certainly find it on our uh, website or through the YouTube channel after the fact. And uh, we're going to encourage all of your input. And this is a topic I'm hoping everybody's got a story or a question or a comment about. Uh, you can type them in using the question box on the uh, on the control screen. Or if you see the little hand, hand wavy icon up where it says muted on the screen, you click on that and we're able to unmute you. And if you've got a microphone, you'll be able to talk. So we're happy to have the conversation going as many ways as we possibly can. I see Shane is uh, online. He's heckling Alex and Jeff virtually. I'd like to see, you know, don't be afraid to heckle either. We can take the abuse. Uh, wouldn't be the first time, won't be the last. So I see a bunch of folks online that I, a lot of names I recognize, some I don't. Uh, I may pick on one or two. Shane, since you've uh, waved your hand and I know you've got a microphone, you never know what could happen. <laughs> so. We've already started this short discussion with panelists, roundtable discussion with attendees, where we mix and match stuff. So what I typically do, we'll hit four topics. These are the four I picked for today, but uh, we can go anywhere with this. So if there's something we don't touch and you've got a question, like I said, raise your hand, type a question into the question box. I'll handle stuff as I see it. I've got uh, multiple monitors, not as many as Alex has. Alex, how many monitors are you looking at right now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven behind me, eight, nine over there. There you go. So some people just get a little carried away with this stuff. So we're going to talk about grounding. Um, now, the interesting thing is that uh, right now in this part of the province, we're under a rainfall and potentially some thunder uh, advisory, which is a rare occurrence for this part of the world. Uh, up in the Midwest where Alex is, you guys get a lot more of the flashy, boomy stuff. Oh, yeah. So, it depends on the hour. Don't like the weather, wait five minutes. And drive five miles. Yep. So the cool thing about it is Alex has got some experience. I've got some experience. Uh, we talk a lot and we'll have some fun. We're going to talk about ferrites, of course, because we can't talk about grounding and lightning protection without me talking about ferrites. Uh, we'll talk about building new sites, fixing existing sites. And this is the one where I'm going to expect all the folks in the audience to throw up their hands, ask the questions. But like I said, anywhere along, let's uh, let's have some fun. Going to credit Elaine Jones. Elaine does a lot of our PR work, and Elaine did a time lapse shot of the uh, skies over uh, her neck of the woods down in Arizona. So uh, as you can see, lightning happens, and it's big and it's scary. And what do we do about it? Well, the first thing we do is get grounded. So Here's the cool thing. Every picture that I've ever put up in a slideshow for lightning protection has got something that's not perfect about it, something that could be improved. So we're going to play 20 questions here. I'm going to uh, tweak Alec. Alec. Alex, what's wrong with this picture? Oh, you're going to make me put me on the spot here. Hold on. I got to move it over to the bigger monitor because I need to get my eyeballs out. Oh, what did you do here? So what you're looking at is a bunch of coax shields from uh, two of them are from a tower feed, like feeding out to the tower, and two of them are the sample loop lines coming mm -hmm. back. So what's wrong with the grounds in particular? See anything that jumps out and grabs you? Other than they're painted? Nope, that's not it specifically. I mean, I don't see an issue with that. But uh, if you look, 
at a couple of them, they are they're, they're excessive length and loops. Um, oh short, yeah, short and straight wherever we can. Yeah, lightning um, does not like to go around bends. Right, and this one is actually a kind of a cool one. Uh, there, Shane, Shane was going to suggest the loop length. Shane, I'm going to get you to start raising your hand, buddy. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you got a microphone or not, but we'll put you on the spot. So uh, exactly, uh, keep them short, keep them straight. Uh, this one is a site outside of Chicago. It's actually a pretty good site overall. I mean, it's one of the better laid out ones that I've encountered. So uh, I don't uh, don't knock too many demerit points or something like that. <laughs> Same here when you've got uh, ground kits, like I said, keep them short and straight. If I was doing the bulkhead ground on the right, um, well, Alex, what would you do on that one? The bulkhead on the right? Well, yep. uh, the tails are way too long and they're going up and down and under, they should be coming straight down. Yeah, that's foremost. exactly it. If you fed them down through the top, you could cut almost six inches of resistance out of that line and some inductance. So yeah. definitely wherever you can, short and straight. The other thing, and uh, everybody knows that I really don't like bolted connections. Now in a bulkhead panel like this, you don't have a choice but to do a, a pressure fit connection with a bolt. Um, so make sure you do a liberal use of no locks or your antioxidant of choice, you know, in that, a pinch. And Go the strap out. should be, I would braise the strap just because you know that's going to be permanent. Yep. Yeah. Wherever you can, a uh, thermal, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm going to have a brain fart right now, but a, a proper, proper bonded connection, whether it's braised, whether it's silphos, uh, you know, in something like this, you're not going to do it. But if you're tying a two gauge wire to a ground rod, CAD welds, those are a wonderful thing. And uh, CAD weld molds. Uh, so let's see. Okay, we got a couple here. Um, bolted versus CAD weld from Eric. Okay, look at these comments coming in already. This is what I like to see. <laughs> We're going to scroll back up a little. Okay, so Eric asked about uh, bolted versus CAD weld. The issue with bolted connections, and this is why I'm glad we're using web cameras because I have a little visual that requires both hands. But uh, anytime you've got a stranded wire, like a two gauge ground wire going into a bolted connection, after time, it's going to compress. The same happens when you've got a lug bolted to a panel that will potentially work loose over time. You've got a, uh, typically a copper lug with uh, probably some plating on it, a copper plate and usually a steel bolt. So as the room heats and cools summer to winter, there's gonna be expansion and contraction. There's just naturally some vibration with just uh, fans and building vibrations. So that'll, it will over time, I'm sure it can over time work loose. So definitely I prefer the, uh, the welded or the exo exothermic is the word I was trying to think of earlier, but a, a more permanent bond whenever I can get one. And uh, you know the the fun part of metallurgy when it comes to grounding specifically is you're you're mixing metals. You've got you know stainless steel mixing with copper, or brass, or whatever in a compression fitting. If you've got an eyelet going to that bulkhead connector, so on and so forth, those things will cause headaches. And you'll be standing there, well, it's grounded. It it, it worked fine. Well. Did you notice all the corrosion around the bolt or you know, right. the, the other issue on the copper plate? Mm -hmm. The other issue is that two pieces of metal, if you looked at them microscopically, metal is not 100% flat. So it, it's just infinite series of ridges and valleys. So you're not going to get as good a connection unless you use a contact enhancer or antioxidant or something to uh, to fill in all those grooves. So that, that's the big reason right there for that. Um, let's see, George mentions that uh, loops do around for allow for uh, rain drips if there's a leak. And that's not an invalid point, but uh, typically I would much rather, and I mean, on a horizontal run like this, about the only way you'd have a leak is if your uh, if the boot on the outside was, was bad. Um, and in that case, you put the drip loop in your coax in the out, uh, where it comes off the tower. Be I was going to say, yeah, the, it needs to be on the outside to begin with. So if you're, if you're coming straight down into the tower and the one like this, you're already asking for trouble anyway. Yeah. 
So do others silver solder their crimp connections that are prior to earthing systems? And that's a good question. If you've got a, so, uh, and take for example, a two gauge wire and uh, a crimp lug. Uh, let's see, if we look the uh, left-hand picture where the surge protector ground comes down on the right, um, there's a crimp lug there. So those crimp lugs require a very specific tool to crimp them properly in order to displace all the air from the connection, from the connector. And those tools are really expensive, like several hundred dollars or more. So mine was about twelve hundred. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of cases where those lugs get put on. Somebody hits them with a pair of vice grips and calls it good enough. And good enough isn't usually good enough. So definitely in a case like that, if you can still faucet or silver solder it, that uh, that gives you that exothermic bond. So that's a, a really good idea. Thank you, Eric, for that. Um, and that's what I was saying before. If I can, I like to see some sort of exothermic bond. I'm going to use that word a lot today now that I finally remember the word I was trying to think of. Uh, so definitely, those are the kinds of things that you want to be looking for when you're doing a grounding analysis for your building. Um, I think I've got everything so far, so we will carry on. Oh, let's see, Greg's got a question. Um, have you pointed out the ground cables running through metallic conduit? That was the next line in this one. Thank you, Greg, mm -hmm. that's a good point. So the left side, you've got two ground wires and they're both coming through conduit. Now in this particular installation, this is Willis Tower, and you're not allowed to run a conductor without it going through a conduit. The challenge with running a single ground wire through a conduit is that steel conduit is ferrous, which means that you've created a ferrite, which means you've created a choke and added a lot of inductance to the wire that's supposed to be the lowest possible resistance path for a lightning strike. So absolutely, that's a, an excellent point. Don't ever, when you can, well, don't ever run a, a single conductor ground through a uh, steel conduit. If you have to use conduit, use PVC. And I mean, that's available as well. And you got to so, watch out too for the, uh, uh, I've seen guys where they use the uh, steel reinforced flex PVC. You know, right. it's got the windings to to reinforce it. Yeah, that that mm -hmm. don't work either. You well, see, basically same thing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the same deal for a ground wire. You know, now right. as far as worrying about it impacting the ground resistance, I'm less worried about that. But it it does act like a ferrite. Mm -hmm. Let's see. When mounting an STL transmitter to a tall mast, how much below the right lightning rod should the antenna be mounted? And that is an interesting question. I'm dubious on the value of lightning rods anyway. All you're doing is adding a little height to the tower, which is going to get hit regardless. So, you know, the 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 idea of making it an even, well, there's no even better target. If it's a thousand foot tower in the middle of a cornfield in the plains of Iowa, it's going to get hit if there's a lightning strike within 10 miles. Several times a minute in a good storm. So definitely, if you can put the antenna below the top, obviously you're going to do that, but it's more going to depend on the grounding kits and uh, the ferrite and the entrance grounds and the things you do after the fact. So, uh, so where you put the antenna is a little less important than what you do as you uh, go down the tower below the antenna. I find more of the value outside of lightning rods, like Jeff said, is, you know, you're just adding more height to get it struck and, you know, one good strike and that pointy thing has turned into slag of mess and, and is gone. So it, it's the, the sacrificial land. The, the thing that I found works better is like the static cats and the dissipators, the bed and um, nails. So Shane brought that up also, and that, that was where I was headed, the static dissipators. So the way the dissipators work, is uh, it's intentional corona. They work through point discharge theory where it's a sharp point that bleeds off the uh, charge as the tower starts to ionize. Um, will it stop a direct strike? Strike? No, but especially on an AM where they help a lot is if your uh, guy wire insulators, the compression insulators have arced a few times and have carbon trails on them. Then as the tower starts to ionize when a storm's approaching, the static dissipators will help bleed off a lot of that charge rather than having it arcing across the guy wire insulators 
top loading the antenna and causing the transmitter to shut down and, or hiccup with SWR uh, shutbacks. So, and you need and more than one of them. You need you need more than just the top. I find that you got to put them in the middle too. It will depend purely on the height of the tower. Typically, they recommend every 200 feet or so. So if you got a short, you know, quarter wave tower of 1500, top will probably do. Right. But if you've got a guide tower, you can also get the ones that go near the guy wire insulators. Just clamp right onto the uh, onto the guy wire itself. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, they're definitely a useful thing. Um, let's see if PVC is not an option. How about installing a grounding bush into the steel conduit and bond the grounding conductor to the conduit in that fashion, um, eliminating the choking choking effect of an open-ended conduit. And that would help to an extent, but uh, the challenge, yeah, I, I think that probably would help to an extent. I mean, you've still got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, porous material around the conductor. So I'd, I'd have to think about that one, but Peter, that's a, a good point. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So, all right, oh, lightning rods at the top can protect power tower light beacons and their controllers. And that, that's not a bad point there, Chris. And same deal, what you're doing basically is uh, moving the strike point a couple of feet above the tower light instead of at the tower light. But like Alex said, if you put a crow's nest at the top, you're going to achieve something similar. Mm -hmm. So yeah, anything but anything project, projecting above the beacon would uh, would be a good point. So yeah, thanks. Uh, that's uh, Chris Hayes in uh, LA, if I'm not mistaken, California anyway. And, so, and in my you. personal experience, you know, getting struck at the top of the tower because you're the tallest thing around. Yes, it happens, but it's actually not as common as people think. You know, it, lightning wants to go towards where the energy is the fastest way down. The tower sometimes isn't the best way or fastest way. Usually it's the antenna. This depends, but uh, either an way. AM, on, the tower, on an FM, I've gotten more lightning strikes direct to bays than I have mm -hmm. the actual, you know, the strike count on the tower itself. Right. And I mean, that also the other thing you run into is that the... Uh, the um, lightning can hit the tower, run down, and then be capacitively induced onto the coax. Right. So, you know, but and yeah, you're course, not going to burn it. <laughs> of course, if lightning was predictable, this would be easy. Yeah, well, there's that too. <laughs> uh, why are the Nautel transmitter subchassis bonded to a common point at the top of the transmitter, but the bottom, whoops, bond, cabinet bonding bolt is near the bottom? Okay, so. Eric, I can answer that. Uh, the reason the ground is at the bottom is because a lot of folks run ground strap on at floor level, so we needed to give them a point. If you look at that uh, ground bolt at the bottom, what you will see is it's on an insulated stud, and if you look inside, there are two insulated wires that go in, up to the top to the uh, primary ground at the output connector. So. It was provided just to give you an easy connection point for a ground strap, but it is designed to be part of that uh, single point grounding at the output connector. Why are there no exothermic weld points to the Nautel cabinets? And that is for the exact same reason, to give you a, uh, an, a the ability to do a single point ground at the output connector. That and the fact that uh, we have a wide variety of customer skill sets that we deal with. And I would hesitate to have some of them TIG welding anything to my transmitter as an example. Um, but yeah, no, that's a good point. And uh, definitely if you look at any of our bigger transmitters, the six foot rack ones, you will see that the ground stud is insulated and that inside there's insulated wires going directly to the primary ground, which is the output connector. So thank you, Eric, for that point. All right, moving along. I think we covered everything I had there. Um, this one is one of my favorite slides to present. And uh, I know Marco's in the audience. I know he's seen this. Uh, Wayne's here, Wayne's seen this. I know Shane's seen this several times. This is a site I got called out to. They were losing a lot of switching power supplies. The, this is the primary building ground right here from the surge protector. And the first thing you see is that, uh, well, the first thing you see is the wires going through a conduit and we had that discussion and that that got resolved pretty quickly and it's 
clamped, the ground wire is clamped to a ground rod that they had to cut the building footing away to get to. And I looked and I thought, and I scratched my head and I looked at the ground rod a little more carefully and it's threaded. And I realized it's not a ground rod, it's the J bolt that's used to hold the building onto the concrete pad. So make sure your ground connection is really ground. I've got another one I like to show uh, somebody, the, the small building where you know, you've know you got an owner who does the engineering duties, the DJ, the sales guy, he's everything, he, he does it all. And a, an electrician friend had told him that in a pinch, a cold water pipe could be used to a ground, so as a ground. So I walk in and there's a one kilowatt transmitter with wire going to the ground lug on the back. And that wire is running over and it's hose clamped to a cold water pipe. And that's beautiful. It was PVC water pipe. So you got to watch for that as well. And Alex, I know you've run into one or two of those. Uh, we had a conversation oh, yeah. not too long ago, but one in, uh, in northern Wisconsin, I think. Yep. What was the story on that one? Tell me that. Uh, they had... Uh... <laughs> Got a phone call about it, and they're like, "Well, well we're, we keep losing all these modules." And I'm like, oh, "Well, show me pictures of your grounding." And they had done exactly that. And instead of you know a single strap or anything, they had bundled a bunch of uh, little wires, like some Romex they had laying around, and ran it over to the PVC pipe, at which was because it was a PEX fitting that transitioned to copper. He thought it was okay. So. Yeah. You get some very interesting things there. Uh, right. Let's see. Also, concrete uh, explodes too, by the way. So putting it on that J-bolt, <laughs> it takes a good hit. Concrete yeah. will explode. And uh, we'll actually, I don't. This isn't my full-blown lightning protection presentation because we want this to be much more interactive. So uh, I kept the slides to a minimum. But uh, one of the ones I show is how uh, guy wires, especially if you've got an FM tower, the uh, guy anchors are a lot of times in a concrete pier and you'll usually see right above the turnbuckle a, uh, a ground wire clamped to the, guy, to the guy wire and run to a ground rod right beside the pier. And the purpose of that is to give you a parallel path to ground that is not through the concrete because if you run a massive amount of current, through something that contains 50% moisture, the moisture turns to steam, steam expands, concrete explodes, bad things happen. Things um, go boom. Things go boom. Wayne has got a uh, comment here. If you have an electrical inspector busting your chops, you can bond a steel conduit to the grounding conductor at both ends, eliminating the inductive effect caused by the steel conduit. Okay, so it uh, just showed up twice. Good, beautiful. And that's also code compliant. And that is and a. I'll, I'll give you one better. And yes, I've heard people doing that. It's the electrical okay. inspector that'll pass that. The building inspector will say that's a live wire now. Yeah, yeah. So, so you run luck into on your local politician arguments. <laughs> you run into challenges either way, and it does vary from one area to another. Not just one state to another state, or one country to another country, one town to another town. In a lot of places. Yep. Um, one other thing that I've run into a lot, and uh, especially in the United States, it's interesting because although the NEC, the National Electrical Code, gets updated on a regular basis, different states' electrical codes follow various versions of the NEC, and one or two states don't follow any recognized version of the NEC. They have their own independent code, which Tennessee, may or may not I'm looking apply. at you. Uh, Mississippi, uh, there's more than one. Yeah. Um, the point being that around about 2008 to 2010, Article 250 of the NEC got rewritten to specify that facility grounds and electrical grounds needed to be bonded together. And uh, this, even now, you run into a lot of situations where the um, the inspector, especially if he's used to working off an old copy, will argue connecting your tower grounds or your your transmitter building ground to the AC ground, when in reality they really do need to be connected together. 
Um, let's see. The one thing that I usually tell any of my electricians on a new install or, you know, coming in and retrofitting, my litmus test for the, the knowledge of that electrician is ask for hospital grade grounding. Mm -hmm. That's pretty universal. Um, and they, if they understand what that is, you got a good guy. If they don't know what it is, you ask him to go ask his boss or, you know, his master electrician, what hospital grade grounding is. Um, mm -hmm. and that, that's a, that's a pretty universal because, you know, even outside of those municipalities that don't follow the NEC, they understand the hospital grade factor. That one right. is pretty universal. So um, that is, that, uh, that that's 90% of the battle. Let's see, uh, our GV5 is top of an 11 floor apartment building. Ground cable comes from the basement all the way up and connect to a common ground strap. Uh, let's see, outside the roof shed, two ground cables, 20 feet long, connect to this strap, come into another strap near the AC panel. The AC panel is also grounded from the power room, the adjacent power room, which is connected to its own ground. Now I get a perfect ground loop. This is Javad from Toronto, and I remember we uh, we looked at uh, his uh, layout. I think I may still have a sketch of it uh, somewhere in my notes over to my left. And uh, it's it's an intriguing situation. And in that kind of scenario where you've got several, separate electrical running up 11 stories, you've got uh, your own ground for the building running up 11 stories, about the only thing you can do is treat your transmitter room as your own little world. So when they come into your transmitter room, they get tied together and then you carry on from there. That's about all you can do. Obviously, you're not going to tie them at the source where the AC comes into the building because you don't ever have control over that area. So yeah, sometimes you can only work with what you've got. Sometimes you're going to make the best of a bad situation, and uh, with any luck at all, we uh, will make it good enough that we don't blow a lot of stuff up. Um, let's see. Are you seeing you for grounds in new construction of transmitter buildings? Somewhat. Uh, so the U for ground really is more to prevent concrete spalling than anything, as I understand it. It's just the system of how the rebar is laid out in the concrete itself. Um, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's been my understanding. Yeah, that's about what I've gotten out of it too. So now Halo Grounds, the phone company configuration, that's a whole different kettle of fish. And I see a lot of those. I'm neutral about them with a caveat. Uh, when you run a ground ring around the roof of the building and tie a bunch of things to it, it's really easy to lose control of the grounding. And what you've got to remember is the whole point here is to try to give a direct connection from the AC lines through a surge protector to the ground system. And that way, if something comes in on the AC, it goes straight to ground through the surge protector. If you get a tower strike and impedance spikes high, then you've got a path out to the AC lines or the voltage rather spikes high. Um, so the goal here is to get maintain that direct path and have all of the equipment that's hanging off the AC line or connected to ground look like a much higher resistance alternative path. Because you're going to have every piece of gear in the broadcast facility will have AC coming into it and most of them will have a ground tied to them, whether it's directly through a strap whether it's a coax attached to it, whether it's just being bolted in a rack that's grounded. So you've got that path and the goal is to make that look a lot less attractive to surge current than the path through the ground strap to the AC protector and out to the power lines. So that's what we're trying to accomplish. So the Uper grounds and the Halo grounds are all cool, but you need to be very careful with them and uh, make sure that you don't circumvent your single point grounding. The one thing I don't like, just real quickly on the, the halo grounds, especially if you buy a prefab building from any of the popular prefab buildings, because they're used to telecom and they get those specs from telecom. Uh, I know there's a handful of them out there that have a broadcast spec that the industry has helped write for them. So if you order a building, you know, prefab from uh, Thermobond or something like that, you have to actually specify whether you're telecom or broadcast. They have two different specifications because telecom will give you the little you know, half inch aluminum tube halo ground, whereas the broadcast spec will have four inch strap and bus bars everywhere. Yeah. Uh, big difference. Uh, and those halo grounds, when they when the telco 
industry buys them, they're buried in the wall. So you don't know how they're bonded, how they're connected, nothing. And all you see is these little tubes of wire coming out of the base of the building that you have no idea which one's which and what's it supposed to do. And 90% of the times the guys placing the building fold them under and crush them on the building itself. I've been to a few sites like that where they're just like, well, where's your ground? Well, I see the halo. Where's it come out? And they're like, right there. So it was never actually attached. Yeah. So things and, to watch uh, out for when you're dealing with those kinds of things in new construction. And we'll talk on that a little more too in a bit, but uh, I've run into that. The other issue and the only real issue I have with halos is that typically they will have a down lead from each of the corner of the building. So you've got four down leads. Mm -hmm. And if you run the four leads out to a ground wire and don't have them tied together, you've got earth impedance between each point. You've got whatever the wire resistance is going to each point with their mechanical connections because they're all crimp connected. Yep. So at that point, like I said, it's just way too easy to lose control, and it's uh, not my uh, not my preference. But again, you can you can definitely you can take a halo system and make it really really good. So it purely depends how you put it together. That's true. Um, uh, Jeff Wilson asked, and uh, Jeff's feeding us questions. Or maybe we, uh, uh, at least he's listening. That's always cool. Mm -hmm. Be paying attention. Preference for braid versus strap. Now, Alex, I'll let you address that, and then I'll hit it too. My, from the contractor perspective, it's an entirely situational question. Uh, you know, are you doing a retrofit, a new build? You know, is this a new ins installation? Are you trying to fix a grounding problem already? What are you allowed to do to the structure versus what you can't, you know, what, what's feasible? Um, you know, the, I prefer strap myself just because the surface area is what you want. So in, in, a, in a braided cable, you've got to get a pretty thick braided cable to get the same amount of surface area you do in a four inch strap. Um, I have a roll of a thousand feet of Georgia copper four inch strap that I paid a pretty penny for back in the day. And it does not leave my side. It's sitting right over there. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's my kid's college tuition is what I call that. But <laughs> the, uh, you, if you have to use braided cable surface area is the name of the game. Um, make sure it's got a lot of surface area and it has to be big enough to equal. And, I, and Jeff can help me out here. I don't remember what the, the stranded cable is that you have to get to equal a four inch strap, but it's pretty dang large. It's uh, around 2,500 KC mil. So to give you a reference point, a two inch strap, a two inch strap has a bigger surface area than a four off cable. Right. Um, now, I prefer strap also, but for a totally different reason, because braid is made up of a whole bunch of individual conductors that are wound around. And if you took those conductors and unwound them and laid them out, um, they're going to be about 25% longer than a foot of strap. So more length means, you know, over and above the resistance being higher, the uh, more length is more resistance. So. I just, uh, I prefer not to do that. Um, let's see, Eric has asked if, uh, oh, Bob Trimble makes a good point. If you're an ARRL member as a ham radio operator and you renew your membership with a promo code, which Bob did not give me, then uh, you can get a free grounding and bonding uh, booklet. So uh, that's a good point. Uh, Bob is uh, with Iris Specialties of uh, Washington. So if you go to the Iris Specialties website, you could probably email Bob directly and say, hey, what's the code for this grounding book? We'll make a bombs problem, unless he answers me later on with the information. Um, Eric wants to know, can we send you photos that will make you cry? I don't promise they won't will make me cry, but I do promise any photos you send me may or may not get used in a presentation down the road with permission. So absolutely send me the uh, good stories, the bad stories, and everything else. I've made that mistake many times, Eric, and you'll see why pretty soon. Okay, um, Alex, healthcare grounding doesn't allow the use of a conduit as an electrical ground. You must run a grounding conductor to each device, and it's by far the best method. And that was the point of asking for the uh, yep. hospital grounding to avoid the conduit. Yep. So absolutely, good point. 
Um, Shane says Motorola R25. I think that's uh, R66, Shane, the Motorola grounding standard that 56. you're looking at there. 56. There yep. you go. See, you know, if we throw two digit numbers at it long enough, one of us yep. is going to be right. Um, and, and, and they are the most stringent grounding system that, that's out there. They literally wrote the book on that. They um, have. Um, now, they do focus a lot more on the use of wire over strap because, again, it's designed for the telecom industry, as we discussed. That's two-way, yeah. Yep. But uh, it's certainly, if you're into a really good technical read, it's it's not really long. It's like 50, 60 yep. pages long. I've got a copy on my laptop, and it is a, a, a matter of fact, it is public domain PDF. If anybody yes. wants to email me, I'm happy to send you a link to it or send you a copy. And for broadcast, when you're dealing with the Motorola R56 standard, you have to scale everything up because remember, in their world, the biggest thing they ever really deal with is inch and a quarter, inch and five eighths on a you know on a really high end day. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, their world is half inch to seven eighths. Um, so you, you have to accommodate sizing. You know, we're dealing with 20, 30, 60, 100 kilowatt transmitters. They're used to dealing with 500, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know sizing is is an important thing to remember but more more importantly is how they do it right right you know and uh the, on that uh wayne notes that if anybody ties anything to a halo they need to be booted out of the site because doing so eliminates the faraday cage purpose of a halo uh, wayne i'm going to question that a little and maybe you could uh clarify it if you don't have a mic and want to hand wave and pop right up but uh the um the, the down leads tend to be far enough apart that I'm not 100% sure how they could get a whole lot of Faraday cage to anything above an AM wavelength. Um, I guess it depends too on the size of the building and, and maybe I'm misunderstanding. So if you want to throw in some clarification, then, uh, then, then certainly uh, let me know. Also, I see that Mike Glazer has his hand up. So, Mike, I'm going to open. I'm, so, I pulled the mute off you. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself in the control panel, then uh, let me know. Uh, let me know what you're thinking. And I'm not seeing Michael's mute come off. All right, but well, we'll carry on. And uh, so, Michael, you uh, you do have your mute off. I'll uh, keep an eye on there, and uh, just uh, if I see you go green, we'll uh, we'll bring you in. Uh, let's see. So, Forest Service is similar. Oh, there we go. Bureau of Land Management site. Shane's hitting me with a whole bunch of stuff here. Always. 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 Never use braid from Eric. Braid. Oh, there's a good point too. Braid oxidizes in each filament because it becomes its own path. You've almost created lit litz wire at that point. That's true. And, and it's a low impedance path because the skin's oxidized, resistance has gone up. So yeah, another good argument for strap over braid. Thanks very much, Eric. Good point. And the number one question I get from a lot of people is how do I attach strap, four inch strap to a rod? Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of guys are like, well, can I bolt it or, you know, put those pinch in? I was like, how do I get it around there? And I'm like, well, again, the, the thermo, exothermic connection, CAD weld the thing. Best yeah. thing you can do is make sure that that thing is not going to go anywhere. And what I've done too in the past is, you know, I've, I've got a lot of urban facilities, you know, where exposed copper is not exactly the bright, nice shiny copper, really bad neighborhood kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I've uh, the, the one good thing you can do for, do for Plasti Dip and Flex Seal and stuff like that, just spray it with bed liner, or paint it, or you know, mm -hmm. just make it go away. But you know it's there, um, and that's another good point. If you are doing a ground system, map it. Mm -hmm. You need to know, and the future people who come into your facility need to know where those grounds are and what's attached to it. Well, you know, especially having to if, deconstruct it. Especially if you've got them buried for any reason, well, to mm -hmm. keep them safe from copper thieves, for example. Right. And I did, uh, I did I mean, an AM ground system where every 12 feet we buried a three-gallon pail, filled it with concrete, and ran the radial through it because mm -hmm. copper thieves were a big problem. So yep. trying to rip up the copper system, you were getting about you know 600 pounds of 
concrete buckets with it. Yeah. I, it uh, had useless. A, I had a guy in, uh, I think it was Vermont, that had his AM radio system stolen twice in the course of a year, and the third time he replaced it with barbed wire. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said it doesn't get out quite as far, but he says it's almost as far. It's hard to tell the difference. He goes, I replace it every five to 10 years because that's about how long for barbed wire disintegrates. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it, uh, there you go. So you do what you got to. And uh, we'll talk about creative solutions in a little bit, too. Um, Bob Trimble mentioned, so he talking about the uh, book, the promo code uh, for the ARRL membership. If you email him at RFSWA, so RF Specialties Washington, at BTIS.us, that's Bravo Tango India Sierra.us, then uh, he's uh, happy to give you the code for the uh, ARL. He says the code does change time to time, so it is a, a moving target. It's not something you can just give you here. Um, so, oh, look at that. Uh -oh. <laughs> I've, got, I've got background conversations going here. It's the coolest thing ever about being able to uh, to do this this way. But um, Shane Tobin, your microphone oh. is live. Hello. You just made Hi. a mistake on muting me. Oh, my goodness. You're not at home, are you? Is Andrea around? Do we have to hide? <laughs> no, no, not at home. No dogs. No, it's just me in my in my uh, lovely little office here uh, by my lonesome. At, uh, <laughs> you got a plant for my orders. I did finally get a plant, yes. And it's the kind I can't even kill. <laughs> Perfect. That's the best kind. So for anybody who doesn't know him, Shane is uh, one of the senior engineers at uh, EMF K-Love Air One. And uh, Shane is uh, former director of engineering for Wisconsin Public Radio. Wyoming, the other uh, Wyoming. Wyoming, other sorry. Yes. Hey, I'm, and I'm and he was a staff engineer at Minnesota Public Radio, and he hails from my neck of the woods. So, uh, yeah. yep. so um, Shane, one of the comments you'd uh, made was, uh, does anybody else cover copper with tar or paint it? And that kind of leads into what Alex is talking about with the, the truck bed liner and stuff. And... Uh, it really reduces the value, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And uh, the other thing I was going to mention: How do you guys feel about uh, about like uh, clad copper, so like uh, aluminum clad copper or some uh, stuff like that? I've seen that used as well. Yeah. Um, the other thing I've seen a lot of is uh, the the other way around: copper clad steel, and then that's uh, true. Paint. Yep. And and then because that stuff typically is stamped all the way along its length as uh, as CCSR. So uh, it uh, automatically, I, and I've seen other people run pure copper and then stamp it as uh, CCSR. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there, there's definitely some options there. Um, let's see, Wayne had added a point about the halo. The down leads need to be connected to grounding electrodes. Grounding electrodes must be bonded a minimum six, uh, number six buried copper, 24 inches down, forms another ground ring. Okay, so that's how he's getting the Faraday cage effect. It's grounded top and bottom and tied together. Right, and I don't think I've ever been to a site where anybody actually did the bottom half. No, uh, I've been to one. And uh, it, again, basically, they ran four-inch strap around the building and drove the ground rods through it. Yep. And said, good enough. But yeah, as far as the copper clad stuff, uh, I, I don't like it. It doesn't work well for Ethernet. It's certainly not as conductive i mean you got the similar metals yeah the metallurgy is good it's not going to cause a whole lot of problem but it's 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 still got a resistance value and it's a weird one mm -hmm. um so, so for, I, I you know for what we want to do here it's basically ccsr versus copper is kind of a moot thing because when you look at that versus strap it's it's you know apples yeah, to peanuts cool. so yeah Right. So, you know, again, the strap, the strap's got a tenth of the resistance per foot of a, of a two gauge wire. So that that's, let's see, alternative wire other than barbed wire is electric wire for cattle, electric fence wire. That's a good point, Dan. That is, yeah, that would work too, steel wire. Uh, let's see. It's actually good antenna making tools too. <laughs> a lot of AM. So, but yes, it, it's a nice heavy wire. I use it for a lot of uh, gardening stuff as well. Yes, um, it, it's a multi-purpose uh, wire. Yeah. 
And Eric has asked, what's the email address to send Jeff these photos? Well, Eric, that's my email address. Uh, you can find me on the contact us on our webpage or it's jwelton, J-W-E-L-T-O-N at notl.com. And uh, let's see. Okay, well, let's move ahead a little bit in our uh, slideshow. I am going to do something risky. I was messing around, which I should never do. And I don't think I screwed up the slide. I guess not. And this is coming back to one of Alex's points. You can have the best ground. And this is a site in Little Rock I walked into. It was a very well laid out site, nicely grounded inside, overall beautiful, but they were having some problems. We get outside and uh, those bushes, I'm here to tell you, I found out what chiggers were at this particular site. Chiggers are the nastiest little things in the planet almost. But anyway, um, so this, uh, this ground strap was coming out behind that bush full of chiggers and it went absolutely nowhere. It had been cut off and removed by somebody who happened to see it for the value. And uh, so absolutely, again, the best ground in the world, even after you've determined that you're not connected to a PVC water pipe is uh, not gonna do you much good if it doesn't go anywhere when it gets outside. And I know Shane, you and I have talked about stuff like that. If you're still, let's see, are you still there? Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, all right. I just want to be sure. I know you're busy and got real. No, I was. I was just going to say I had a comment on strap, especially in mountaintop and windy type of environments. I've seen a number of cases where that strap will come loose, start flopping around in the wind, and then suddenly, well, guess what? You've got an open circuit there. There's no more. You know, mm -hmm. the ground the ground strap has literally bent itself you know, in half Cop and it's, it's copper, awesome. copper is soft metal. It will tear over time. I've had that yeah. happen where it rubs against the building and it just wears itself through. Along yeah. those lines, uh, what are your, what are your thoughts for securing strap in a lot of these situations? Uh, so if you're on a steel building, the, one of the easiest things you can do is pop rivet it right to the surface of the building because the building's painted anyway. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter. If it's on the ground, bury it. Absolutely bury it every time. Concrete um, leg but, bolts. But the other thing, if you're like running down from a coax entry point with a ground kit and you're running strap down to your primary ground, roofing tire the thing right to the side of the building. It, it Two benefits to that, it'll secure it for one and it eliminates the uh, scrapper value for two because no scrapper will take tarred, uh, tarred co or copper. Right. Most common issue I've seen is particularly on mountaintop sites where there's not a lot of soil. I mean, it's pure rock. Uh, you're mm -hmm. lucky to get anything to drive a ground into in the first place. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, a lot of times I've seen that case where the strap, I mean, it's not practical to bury it. Say they run between the building and the tower, for instance. Um, and um, I mean, a lot of cases I've seen people just stack rocks on top of them, but obviously even that's not going to, going to last indefinitely. So, so one of the things we do here, and I mean, most of the sites around here, if you want to run uh, run uh, ground radials, if you want to run them underground, you're using dynamite because we're, well, when they drilled my well, they hit bedrock at 12 feet, and that was a lot more topsoil than some folks have. Um, and what what they'll do is just literally take a couple of yards of gravel and spread spread the gravel over top of the, uh, and make a walkway over top of the ground, ground radial. And just one really good point that, uh, you know, a lot of guys forget, uh, especially the new newer guys in the industry, is a ground system is not maintenance free. You know, you can't just do it once and then forget about it for the next 20 years and it's someone else's problem. You actually have to do stuff with this thing. You know, it, it, it's I put it on my checklist when I go to a site is, you know, get out the wrenches, make sure all the, the, the connections are tight inside the electrical box, outside on the strap, make sure nothing has moved. The one thing that I see a lot of when I go to a new site is you'll take, they did everything right, they'll have a four inch or a two inch strap, but they'll fold it to make a right angle. Mm -hmm. But and they just soldered it. it and not soldered. Right. So you'll start seeing it cutting itself because it's arcing when it gets a, it gets a hit. So yep. you have to braise your folds just the same. Uh, you know, these it, it's not a zero maintenance item. You do need to maintain your ground system because things right. like sharp rocks will move around and cut it, or mm -hmm. the, the locals will get restless and try and rip it off the side of the building. Tar be damned. You know, it's it, it's something they can take. They will try. Uh, you know, 
things like that, you know, uh, uh, air conditioner condensers are, you know, the commonplace because all your utilities go out the same spot. You know, well, what happens when the uh, AC guy came and cleaned out your filters? Oh, he stepped on uh, he stepped on the strap and kind of pulled it off a little bit because he didn't CAD weld. You just could did a a lug fitting on your on your ground rod there. You have to look. You can't just assume. Yeah. Right. And um, along those lines, another one that I see a lot at sites is uh, sites that use chemical grounds. Um, I, yeah. You know, a lot of people again assume that that's kind of a one and done thing. Well, it isn't. They do require maintenance. You got to make sure that those stay, uh, you know, that those stay maintained. Otherwise, you yep. might as well not even have a ground system. Well, and that's a good point. Uh, John Van Milligan had uh, mentioned that they use chem rods in rocky soil, and uh, that is that that's an excellent point. Uh, it also works in really sandy soil because when you've got a situation where you can't get to the water table, to then or at least into lower resistance earth, then all the copper in the world on the surface isn't going to do you a whole lot of good if there's not a place for it to discharge to. So a chem rod is useful, but the backfill material does eventually leach out and it needs to be replenished. Yep. And and like, yeah, water it and add the, uh, what is uh, like a carbon bromide or something like that, but- uh, Yeah, something like that. But yeah, you got to add the backfill material. Um, one other thing that I've run into on a couple of mountain sites, I've got one in Arkansas where the only way they could establish a ground that would keep things from blowing up, and fortunately it wasn't our transmitter, it was uh, the one we replaced, but uh, they uh, they ended up drilling a well, and uh, that you know they just ran the well casing all the way down, and well they put a steel rod down into the well, so you do what you got to do some days bonus then you have water on site <laughs> also a good thing and i mean there's these days there's a lot of sites that don't have too much in the line of facilities so uh definitely a good ground is critical and uh connecting your building to it is just as critical here's another example this is a site in missouri and the ground rod is driven at about a 60 degree angle um, which i think you can see in that picture it's a clamp connection, also not my favorite. Oh, and the ground rod's two feet long, so it didn't even get through the gravel subbed before to hit the earth. So uh, that one required a, a modest improvement. But uh, yeah, and I, I'm going to say we're going along here. Um, we are running up near the top of the hour. I haven't even hit the important part yet. I think so, just wedding ring is made out of this stuff. No, mine's made out of tungsten, but uh, but now you've got me thinking about it. It's a <laughs> potential market right here. Uh, Alex, so you first officially became, I mean, we, we'd known each other as friends for quite a while, and we talked back and forth, and there was a lot of Mongolian barbecue under the bridge. But yep. uh, you first officially became involved with this as the install tech for KVSC in St. Cloud State, putting in a beta GV10 yep. and ser serial number 0.5. Yep, think serial think number one I, half. I think if I remember right, you got the serial number label a little after you got the transmitter. Yep, it but, showed up uh, with the manuals. But uh, anyway, so Alex puts this transmitter in. And he sends me a picture and he's so proud of his install, posted on Facebook, this is awesome. And my first comment was, where's the ferrite? So uh, ferrites are a great way of reducing a common mode signal. You've got a feed and a return. And uh, you know it's, it's just an excellent way, but on their own, they're not gonna solve anything. They're part of a well-designed system. You need a ground. You need the uh, AC line protector and you need good bonded connections. And once you've got that, then the ferrites go on all the equipment hanging off of that path to make it look like a higher impedance for the lightning energy. So any ham who's ever wanted to choke is familiar with, uh, with ferrite toroids. But uh, when you're using them in common mode, you've got a feed and a return going through. And if you get an imbalance current, a surge on either the feed or the return, say a tower strike or an antenna hit, then uh, the ferrite, the magnetic field, tries to induce a surge into the opposing line to keep the, the potential difference between the two at the same level. So they're really good for that. 
They're a great troubleshooting tool if you're running an AM. If you get a ferrite and it gets hot, you got a ground view current flow imbalance. So your feed and return are not equal. So they're, they're a really good tool like that and relatively inexpensive. Um, where do you put them? Where do you put them, Alex? I know where you put them after you're shaming. <laughs> Uh, right at right as close to the transmitters you can get. So, so on the coax, definitely. Um, ideally, your coax will have a ground kit on it where it comes into mm -hmm. the transmitter building that will be bonded to your facility ground. And if you put the ferrites between that point and the transmitter anywhere, whether if you've got a, uh, a coax switch, you can put it either side of the coax switch. Doesn't matter really that much at all. Um, the goal is to make anything on the load side of that coax ground look like part of the system. And, and I'll, I'll add one little thing that I have run across. I've been sent pictures I should send to you, Jeff. I'm slacking on that part. But guys will put the ferrites uh, right on the, the output connector and just leave them sit there on the studs uh, of mm -hmm. the uh, bolts. I've gotten a lot of pictures lately of those getting shattered because of the vibration. So what I like to do is make sure you zip tie or tie wrap them up onto the actual uh, heliax away, you know, on the copper section, not the brass connector, mm -hmm. <laughs> and leaving it sit on those bolts because they do vibrate. Right. A uh, couple of questions here. Uh, so John Van Milligan mentions that the small ferrites we use, uh, our part number is LXP38. They're a three-quarter inch inside diameter, just a bit too small to fit on an XLR connector. So you had to remember to put them on the wire before you uh, put the connector on. Same with the but BNC for a composite. Well, and see, the other thing I'm thinking is uh, since I probably forgot to put the hood on the XLR connector anyway, I got to take it apart regardless. I'll just put the ferrite on when I put the hood on. But uh, that's a good point. Chris Hayes asked what uh, number we use. So ferrite composition, so ferrite is a, uh, is a mix of uh, iron filings, carbon dust, and epoxy to hold it all together. There may be other stuff, but those are the basics. And uh, there are different ways of rating them, but they're all based on the ratio of the iron to, fer or to uh, carbon. Uh, the goal for what we want, where we're running it as a common mode device, where the feed and return should normally be equal. So it's irrelevant. We're not creating a, a choke like we would be if we were winding a single conductor through the toroid and making a, a choke with it. So uh, we want the highest iron com composition we can get. If you uh, go to Amidon Corp, Dot com a m i d o n c o r p dot com uh, Amadon makes ferrites and you can look at the spec sheets and one of the things they give you in the little cut sheet in the ferrite description is the roll off frequency so if you were winding a single conductor through at what frequency would this saturate and uh, that's the lower the frequency the better the ones that we use in uh, our kits are all 43 material for what it's worth. I don't know the ratio of iron specifically to carbon. That uh, might be a cool little research product. Um, let's see, whole bunch of comments coming in. Okay, uh, so that's that. Oh, a lot of grounding advice that has basically put as much copper in the ground as you can afford. Um, even so, if you can't, well, it's in an AM, you don't have much of a choice. <laughs> well, and basically, as much copper in the ground as you can afford is not necessarily the best advice. No, um, actually, it's not, because there is if, a point of diminishing returns. And, well, for an AM, yeah, it happens that after about uh, eight radials, it starts to go down pretty fast, even though 120 is the spec. But uh, that's not related to ground and lightning protection. For lightning protection, point to point to point is probably the most controllable, assuming that you've got a decent ground connection. And by decent ground connection, I mean into the water table or a well or a chem rod or something that's established a, an actual ground point. Um, so, is there a way to quantify it at install time versus down the road to ensure it's working well? There are ground resistance measurement kits. Um, there are a lot of people that charge a lot of money to go out and test the quality of ground systems, but ultimately the best way is to dig it up and look at it. Um, 
If you see oxidation on connections that are clamped, tear them apart and braze them or bond them. If you see wire that's or cable that's uh, oxidized almost through, replace it. So yeah, physical inspection is still about the best way to ensure ground systems work. The only other, the ultimate way to tell if a ground system is working well is things not blowing up. It's probably working well. The the best thing uh, thing uh, when I first started in the broadcast industry 20 years ago, people asked me. Uh, the guy who built the facility, uh, my mentor, he uh, he showed me these northern technologies and LEA surge suppressors on the wall, and he's like, if these lights ever turn off, open them up, replace the MOVs. Uh, okay, this facility had already been there for 20 years, and I asked him, I was like, Have, does it work? He's like, I assume so. I've never had to touch them. <laughs> yep. that's a good point i mean typically sometimes the proof is in the pudding now nathan asks if you can use the split ferrites on audio wires to the equipment or do they need to be a solid ring uh the split ferrites work fine in some cases uh even the big rings that we use which are a four and a quarter inch inside diameter for the three and an eighths coax if you're running heliax with the fittings already attached they obviously won't fit over that and I, I've had a lot of folks use like a, a diamond saw or a jeweler, a diamond coping saw or a jeweler saw to cut them and then JB weld them together. Because, And I say JB weld because JB welds conductive. But, uh, you know, I looked at some epoxy. I think, uh, I don't know if Rich Parker's on. I haven't gone through the uh, attendee list recently, but Rich Parker had done some with uh, Coast Alaska up in Juneau, had done some great work with uh, cutting apart a couple of ferrites, attaching them together with different epoxies and JB weld, and then measuring them, running a loop of wire and measuring the inductance and uh, determined that JB weld worked really, really well. So that uh, that's just another cool little tidbit. We're going to run a little long, but we'll uh, try to keep it entertaining at least. So ferrites on the AC lines, on the uh, coax, uh, Eric had mentioned that two ferrites is better than one to give you the impedance bump to help uh, force the uh, surge currents through your ground system, and that that is true. Uh, two is better than one. Um, people say, should they be together or spaced? I like to see them spaced a little apart, not hard against each other, but that's personal preference. Um, and beyond that, it, again, like with the ground radials, it's a point of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Two is good, one is good, two is better, three is great. After that, you're just throwing money away. And, uh, you know, if you're throwing it our way, absolutely, sure, go ahead. But uh, you really don't need to. So, and, and the effect of looping through, if you could clarify that, Jeff, because you see here is just running it through two ferrites. Could he do the same thing by looping the cable through the single ferrite? Or yes, looping it through no. and double the effect by looping it through again on two? Right now, so what happens basically when you run a wire through a ferrite, that's a one turn inductor. If you loop it through, that's a two turn inductor. So you've effectively doubled the inductance of that particular connection. So yeah, looping is a good idea whenever you can do it. I'm just scrolling down to see if we've covered everything so far. I really try to uh, hit as much of these as I can on the fly. And so far, we're doing good. So excellent. So yeah, if you can, now in some cases, if you're running a uh, four gauge wire for a big transmitter, or if you've got inch and five eighths coax or bigger, you're not gonna loop it. I mean, it's just right. not- But like the perfect. half inch through the, the three inch ferrite, you know, you, can, yeah, you get yeah. a couple turns there. Right, so certainly you can, uh, you can vary it depending on the situation. Now back to things not wrong, and this is something that this is your last part. After your grounding and your ferrites, you need the surge protector. And although I didn't say it specifically, I kind of inferred it earlier, a surge protector, MOVs especially, are bidirectional. So they don't care whether the tower got hit and ground potential spiked really high and it's decoupling out to the AC lines, or whether a power pole down the road got hit and it's uh, sending it to ground, um, that the surge is going to go through the surge protector. Now, this is another example of uh, multiple things, uh, compression connection, don't like it, uh, extra length in the cable, don't like it, and the steel toroid. So this would probably be my least preferred configuration for a surge protector, but uh, certainly it's something you should uh, put in. Also jacketed yeah. cable going into the uh, steel tube there, and uh, it'll rub. 
it's going to wear away the jacket on that uh, conduct on that cable eventually. Yep, yep. And uh, there are surge protectors. There's all kinds of brands and kinds out there. Uh, a shunt type MOV protector with fused links because MOVs almost always fail short circuit. And uh, if they're not fused, then they'll fail open circuit quite dramatically and loudly with uh, lots of magic smoke and all kinds of great stuff like that. So definitely you can, uh, you, you certainly wanna have a surge protector, whether it's an LEA polyphase or trans detector, that's all the same company control concepts. Uh, we use Raycap and they work great. So all kinds of options. Now, sometimes, because Alex was not going to get through this without any abuse whatsoever. Sometimes you have to get creative. So what specifically am I looking at here? Well, I mean, uh, I, I recognize the Home Depot buckets. Yeah, Ace Hardware, but yes, close enough. Uh, but uh, what happened here was that we took the direct hit on the antenna. Uh, and this is one of my stations here in town. Uh, this antenna was actually relatively new install. It was only up to, on the tower a year, and the first big thunderstorm came through the that year and uh, took it. Took it. Uh, it's a three bay Shively that took it on the top bay, and when it, it heated up, the, if, if anybody's ever familiar with the the radomes that Shively uses, it, it reminds you of like a rubber ga rubber made thirty gallon drum trash can, uh, similar material, and so it melted. But the slag from that had started melting and went down onto the next bay below it. So it started melting everything. Uh, it finally, it, it actually didn't get to the third bay, which was impressive in its own right. But uh, how do you fix that when you have no choice? You know, sometimes Thor, you, I, it, it's plastic. I can't ground this very easily. It's going to take it in the shorts. Obviously, there's metal brackets on there to help it get it to where it needs to go, but you know, lightning still lightning. It will always win. So our field modification, instead of waiting for Shively, and Shively was really back ordered at that point. They told me eight weeks for replacement radomes. Well, in the height of storm season here in Minnesota, that's not an option. Uh, so we had to do something. And uh, so I ran to the Ace Hardware, got a bunch of five gallon pails, uh, some epoxy and a razor knife and some orange spray paint. So it didn't look like it stuck out on this, like a sore thumb on top of the tower. And as far as I know, those are still there today. Yes, everybody's gonna go, oh my God, that's not UV. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, it's a radio station temporary is what it is. It, it is definitely a radio station temporary and the owner is well aware that they are still there, but just like a lot of owners, they'll replace it when it fails. So one other comment on the fair rates, uh, Javad had asked if uh, you, you're running low on cores, can I loop cables from two different equipments into the same core? And the short answer is that's a bad idea. Uh, you remember I showed you earlier where we had the feed and the return through, and if you get a surge on one, it induces the an equivalent surge onto the other to keep the potential difference the same, and more to do with the magnetic field. Well, by the same token, if you had a pair from one piece of equipment through and a pair from the other piece of equipment through, and one piece got a surge, then the other piece would see a surge as a result. So you might end up creating more problems than you solve. You're much better off uh, ordering some more ferrites. And you can get them, as I said, amadoncorp.com or from us or from several. Well, those are the two sources I know, but um, uh, Phillips uh, is another source. So there are a bunch of places you can get them. All right. Um, so that wraps it up. We did run a little over. There's, and we probably could have kept going. I told somebody the other day, I did a, uh, presentation for one of the SBE chapters. And I told them when I started, I could go on about this for days, <laughs> let, alone, let alone 45, 50 minutes. So, uh, you know, consider yourselves lucky we're getting out of here with only 10 minutes over time. We do have a bunch of uh, resources. As I said, this webinar will be archived. You can get to it either through our webinars link on our website or through the YouTube channel. Um, we do the Waves newsletter every, three to four months, depending. I think we're probably getting due another one shortly. Uh, I know that one is, uh, 
usually got some information along those lines. I put a tips and trips, tips and tricks article in there. Uh, we do a bunch of other things. So you can certainly uh, reach out and uh, touch us if there's any questions we can help with at all. On that note, I want to thank you very much for spending another Tuesday with us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great day, everybody, and thank you, Alex, for spending some time. Thanks, Jeff.